portfolios of administered items under the uh, Department for Education. The Minister of Appearing is, of course, the Minister for Education. The estimate payments were outlined earlier uh, today for the Department of Education and administered items for the Department for Education. I advise that the proposed payments remain open for examination and refer members to the relevant agency statements. Uh, can I call on the Minister should he wish to make a brief uh, statement in regards to the particular portfolio of administered items and note for the committee a agreed time frame of 4.15 to 4.45 p.m. Minister. Sir, I, I would like to express my thanks to not just people at the SACE Board, but people at the SACE Board and all of the other uh, uh, units agencies uh, uh, and groups that are administered by the Education Department, uh, relationships with whom I am very grateful to have and whose work across a broad range of areas, whether it be in youth arts or uh, oversight bodies or indeed SACE, uh, uh, is exceptionally important, but I want to leave as much time as possible for questions. So instead of a long opening statement, uh, going into detail about all of those wonderful things they do, I'll instead just advise that I have Martin Westwell, uh, who is the Chief Executive of the SACE Board of South Australia sitting to my right. Uh, behind me I have Chris Bernardi, the Chief Financial Officer, and Rick Purse, the Chief Executive of the Education Department. And behind them I have uh, Dr Peter Smith, uh, who is the Executive Director of Strategic Policy and External Relations in the Education Department. The opposition, do you wish to make an opening statement? I do not. Thank you, Chair. No problems. Uh, with that, are there any questions from the committee? The member for Wright. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Minister and Mr Westwell. Uh, could I begin uh, Budget Paper 4, Volume 1 and page 188? And I acknowledge the uh, first, and perhaps I should have said this in an opening statement, but the incredible amount of work the SACE Board does to run a very, very big program of exams. But I, I think it is incumbent on me to ask about the uh, status of the investigation into the psychology exam and what any investigation might have shown about how it occurred. I will invite the Chief Executive, um, Professor Westwell, to uh, uh, respond. So a priority has been on um, uh, making sure that Year 12s for this year uh, will get the results on time this year. So a preliminary, preliminary investigation has identified that a video within the psychology exam and the, the bit rate, the rate, the streaming rate of the video um, interacted with the system um, in such a way that it slowed the exam down. Uh, what that meant was that every student, regardless of whether they were looking at the video or not, was affected uh, by the exam, and that's why we called it to a halt. That's the position that we're in at the moment. We were able to do enough investigation to determine that the subsequent electronic exams um, would run without problem, and that turned out to be the case. Thank you for that answer. And same budget line. Um, I guess might be a question for Mr Westwell or you, the Minister, if you prefer. Um, what reassurances can you give us about um, uh, making sure that something like this doesn't happen at, f at future exams? Um, I thank the uh, member for the question. Uh, on the day, uh, I encouraged Professor Westwell to provide me with advice uh, about the... I think there were two still to come. Uh, and uh, I believe late in the day, the SACE board made a determination that... Uh, they were confident things could go ahead. Uh, and again, uh, I think that, it's, that Professor Westwell and the SACE Board have been up front with the people of South Australia uh, right from the start on this. Uh, I rely on their advice. I'm going to ask Professor Westwell to again provide any further response to uh, that question uh, so that the, uh, the advice that he'll provide me uh, is exactly the same, I promise you, as That's that fine. which he'll provide That's to the I broader community right now. I have no problems with that at all, of course. So, uh, of course, lessons learned. There'll be lessons learned from um, uh, what happened with the psychology exam. Um, what we're finding is that there's been innovators within this space in Australia, and the SACE board really been leading with electronic exams. Um, there are some risks, and of course we do all we can to ameliorate those risks, but we'll certainly take the lessons from this um, and apply those. We're able to do that in quite a short period of time for the remaining two electronic exams. Fantastic. Thank, thank you, Mr Westwell, for your answer. Member for right. Um, Minister, uh, are you contemplating, or is the SACE board indeed contemplating um, putting in place any kind of old-fashioned, so to speak, backups in the future? Do we, do we think that's necessary just in case we get a situation like this arise again? I, I, I think this is something that we'd certainly discussed last year and um, uh, when I think it was three exams. 
uh, and uh, uh, Professor Westwell and I had a couple of discussions and it was ultimately agreed that there would be paper and pen backups for those uh, examinations. They weren't needed in the end. Uh, there was some cost to that, of course, because of, we're talking about over 100 sites where secondary examinations take place. Couriers, the secrecy provisions, there is a complication to uh, all of this. Uh, the psychology exam is one where there was a video file uh, and it's impossible to provide that examination in the same way uh, using uh, just a pen and paper backup. Um, now, one of the advantages of electronic exams is that you are able to uh, engage with the student in the assessment of their learning in a much more uh, real way and you're able to uh, test them on something that's presented to them right then and there um, in an interaction with which is relevant in the real world. Um, so that's the, one of the benefits of electronic exams. It obviously elevates the risk because you can't just replace that with a paper and pen backup right away. Uh, I'll invite Professor Westwell if there's uh, further information to add to that. And I'm, uh, particularly, I think a part of your question was whether the SACE board was giving consideration for future years to any of that. I'll leave it to Professor Westwell. Uh, <clears throat> the reason why we're doing electronic exams is to have better assessment for students to have assessment that looks like the work that they've done at school and to look like what will be expected of them in the workplace and in university. Um, and so being able to push forward with electronic exams mean that we can do things differently, we can do assessment differently. Um, it's very difficult to provide a paper backup for that, so we're not planning on providing paper backup for the future because we'll essentially, we would essentially then have, end up with two exams, the paper exam and the electronic exam. Member for right. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Minister. I, my next questions aren't SACE related in case they, I was going to ask some questions about... Oh, sure, of course. Thank you. Just one uh, SACE question. What's the ambition for other subjects also having electronic exams, and will we get to a place where that's the only form of examination in the future? Professor um, Westwell. We've always taken the, the uh, position that will work with the community to introduce exams. So we're not rushing to do exams for the sake of it. Um, what we're looking to do over this year is to work with the community on another three or four exams. Uh, they might be languages exams, for example, with the success of the Indonesian continuers that we had <coughs> this year. Um, other examinations such as uh, mathematics or some of the um, science exams that have uh, symbolic language, mm -hmm. we're not gonna rush into uh, using computers just for the sake of it. So. Um, those exams might take a little bit longer. So we, we want to take it one step at a time to get better assessment. OK, well, I'll get uh, uh, Rick, Peter to, maybe Peter to come forward. I don't have any particular advisors on the Education Standards Board, but we'll see how we go. So Dr Peter Smith now joins me at the table. Thank you. Oh, thank you. So, Minister, Budget Paper 3, Volume 1, page 193, under highlights, and uh, uh, my understanding is the Education Standards Board is the new name for what was easily the world's worst acronym. Yes. Um, it's definitely the one you're thinking of. Yes. Yep. Uh, three, three registrars brought into one and a very, very long name that we refer to as the Education Standards Board. A, a very wise move. Can I ask uh, how many departmental preschools have been assessed and rated by the Education Standards Board to date? I'll have to take that one on notice. And what was the target for assessments in the last financial year? Um, I'll and, just what, and was that target reached? All right, let me just double check quickly if I have information on that, but I suspect... I don't have it readily here, and so we will... No, uh, maybe, hang on one second. So, um, let me provide a little bit of information about the board's work this year, and uh, perhaps if it doesn't cover everything, we'll provide further information having sought it from the board. So, 
the uh, boards regulates 1,343 early childhood education care services in South Australia across metropolitan, rural and remote locations. As at the 30th of September this year, there were 436 approved providers with 374 operating a single service. There were 1,222 services approved to provide education and care under the national law. There were 121 residual services comprised of in-home care, rural and mobile care and occasional care services. These services are regulated under a metropolitan, sorry, under a modified version of the national law. As at the 30th of September, 95% of eligible services in South Australia have been assessed and rated. The board is responsible for the registration and review of registration of all government and non-government schools as well. You're asking about pr uh, early childhood settings though, weren't you, sir? Yes. Just early childhood, okay. So I'll skip the schools. Um, and, um, I would identify further that the independence of the board as a regulatory authority <coughs> is greatly valued by the community. I'm sure that the members would agree uh, for its consistent approach to approving and rating early childhood services and registering and reviewing schools across the government and non-government education and care sectors. Uh, Chris Chatburn, I think, is very well regarded. She was appointed, uh, I think, when the member for Port Adelaide was the minister. It might have even been her predecessor uh, and, indeed, the current chair of the board, uh, Anne Dulet. Uh, who was previously the, uh, I think she was appointed to the board around 2018, either just before or just after the election. Uh, I'm grateful for her leadership of the board and the work they're doing. Thank you, Minister. If I could take you now to budget paper five, page 36, non-government school loans. Uh, and uh, could I ask how many applications were received under this grant line in the past financial year? Look, I'll take, I'll take that on notice because I'm not 100% sure uh, whether all of the applications go directly to me or to uh, a unit in Treasury. Um, I've got a feeling that it's the latter. Uh, so I certainly have a role in uh, uh, when the proposals are at approval stage, uh, as the former minister would have had. But whether all of those applications I have direct line of sight over or if they get filtered through Treasury first, out of an abundance of caution, I will take that on notice and bring back an answer. Thank you, Minister. Same budget line, budget paper five, page 36, non-government school loans. Uh, can I ask, were any applic applications knocked back or denied? And if so, uh, for what reasons? And again, I will uh, include that in the answer I'm seeking to the previous question. I'll take that on notice alongside it. All right. Thank you, Minister. Uh, budget Paper 5, page 37, uh, non-government school capital grants. Uh, how many applications were received in the last financial year? Were any applications, if you've got some answers, I'll, I'll pause. So, um, the um, first thing I would say in relation to the Catholic <coughs> education sector, half of these grants, or half of the quantum of money uh, goes to Catholic Education SA and half to independent schools. You'd be, you'd be yes. very familiar. It's a long... Uh, in South Australia, we have a historical uh, fact that about the same number of independent schools as Catholic schools. It makes for a certain level of administrative convenience in government, certainly. So Catholic Education makes all the decisions in relation to their loans in uh, compliance with the, uh, the, the process set out. Uh, and indeed... Uh, they make uh, recommendations and uh, determine the, the funding allocations. Um, the, um, in which year is this? Last year, for example, a Catholic Education uh, approved grants were St. St. Francis Xavier's Regional Catholic School at Windvale, a school I imagine the member is familiar with, Very received $2 million for new classrooms and ancillary facilities. St Joseph's Memorial School at Norwood received $470,000 for a performing arts centre, indoor multi-purpose space and library. Uh, St John the Baptist Catholic School at Plimpton 
uh, received $2.4 million for refurbishment of classroom block and flexible learning spaces. St Joseph's School at Kingswood received $303,937 for flexible learning areas, outdoor learning and school entry and administration areas. St Catherine's School at Stirling received $300,000 for multi-purpose hall, staff room and learning areas and it was um, uh, a real pleasure to, uh, to see that school recently with the member for Heysen and the Archbishop, uh, who, uh, 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 can I just say, uh, his homily on the service dedicating that was just stunning and showed a really significant understanding of the importance of education within the Catholic Church's mission uh, and the importance uh, of... Um, I think the uh, looking after the needs of every child in the system, I, was, uh, I, I, I had no reason to doubt that he would have such an approach, but uh, his homily, I think, was really um, uh, touching and, and I'm sure everyone there appreciated it. And uh, uh, the Tennyson Woods Catholic Primary School at Richmond, 131,500. That was the Catholic school's uh, grants and um, uh, together with some administration costs, the total funding is up to 5.778. Uh, million dollars. Uh, That's uh, of course 5.5 .5 million was the original one that's been indexed. Um, pardon me. Now, in relation to independent schools, um, almost all of our independent schools apply for and receive a grant according to a model uh, that we develop in partnership with AISA, the Association of Independent Schools South Australia, another one of those uh, acronyms. And um, so I can provide a, a list to the member <coughs> if the member would. Uh, uh, like me to, but um, uh, it's, uh, it's, it would take up more than the rest of the time we have available now to read them out. Thank you, Minister. The same budget line, budget paper 5, page, page 37. Were any not applications under that capital grants program knocked back or rejected for any reason? And if so, were reasons provided that you can share with the committee? I will uh, take that on notice to double check. Uh, final question on, on this little part here, Minister. Um, have any changes been made to the assessment criteria for that grants line um, since March 2018? Um, I, I'm pretty sure there was a, a change. Um, I think there might have been an issue with whether it was applicable to non-government early childhood services. I've got a feeling the member for Port Adelaide and I might have even had a discussion about one and. Uh, I don't remember being certain at the time as to whether there was a non-government childcare provider in, uh, I don't know if it was in the member's electorate or, or one that had approached her as the shadow minister at the time. Uh, and so I remember that triggered a conversation with AISA at the time uh, on whether or not it was a program designed for schools only uh, or for the broader non-government sector. And I, my recollection is that we had to specify that it was uh, just for schools. Um, and I'll bring back uh, further information to the committee if uh, I'm incorrect there, but I'm pretty sure that that was uh, a, uh, a change made to, uh, inform, to, to have it as a, um, uh, as a clarity of what the original, I, I suspect the original intention of the program always was. Um, I don't think that was a, a change in, in outcome. Uh, I've got a feeling that there might have been some increased flexibility as to what program uh, uh, grants could be for. I think that in the Earth's in the first iteration, uh, there was a discussion about whether it was just for STEM projects or environmental uh, projects, and I think we created ex extra flexibility for schools. Um, it's possible there were other changes. Member for right. Thank you, Minister. Uh, could I take you to Budget Paper 5, page 37, and non-government state government funding arrangements? And if you want to change your personnel, happy to pause for a second if you wish. Now, what effect is the transition to the direct measure of income that the DMI methodology for funding of non-government schools going to have in terms of state government funding? So, um, fairly uh, uh, complex question and um, it's been a, a body of work to try and uh, have an outcome that best serves the needs of our students, our schooling systems, uh, and is uh, uh, fair. So um, there's a couple of impacts that we looked together at once. One was the move that the Commonwealth had made to a direct measure of income <coughs> in assessing parental capacity to pay. 
So uh, for those who are unfamiliar with the context, when we have our national school funding agreements that fund uh, non-government schools, indeed fund government schools, a, uh, 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 the SRS, the School Resourcing <coughs> Standard, it identifies how much you would like to fund them. And then uh, the Commonwealth is uh, uh, on the hook for a certain amount and the state is on the hook for a certain amount. We've agreed to about 22%, I think, uh, of that. But it is less uh, whatever the parental capacity to pay uh, is determined to be. And uh, since the beginning of the uh, Commonwealth Education Act, I think it is, uh, that parental capacity to pay has been determined by a measure that is not going to be used anymore. Effectively, it was based on uh, socioeconomic status data. Um, from the suburbs people were living in. And the Commonwealth determined, and I think changed their legislation uh, to uh, what the member referred to as a direct measure of income. I'm going through this because it's really complicated and I think most people aren't familiar with the detail. And it's really difficult to describe why you make a decision without a little of detail that the Shadow Minister and I and school principals and system leaders might know, but I think others might not necessarily. So that direct measure of income effectively says... A parent's capacity of income should be measured uh, by how much capacity... To, sorry, a parent's uh, capacity to contribute should be measured by how much income they have. And that's best measured by their tax return. And so that transition has been made. But, of course, um, schools have been budgeting based on uh, uh, what they expected to get. So for some schools, it's a bigger change, and for some schools, it's uh, a lesser change. For some schools, it's a positive change. For some schools, it's a negative change. At the same time... Uh, we also have some historical arrangements in relation to the funding of non-government schools as to where they are at that 22% of the <coughs> SRS. For a range of really hard to grapple with, I think, historical accidents, you have some schools that were riding along at maybe 16 or 17% of SRS that were slowly, slowly, slowly getting to 22%, and some schools that were 25 26% some schools that were dramatically higher than that for no obvious historical reason of the SRS that were slowly, slowly, slowly coming down, but it would have taken a very, very long time uh, under a model that had them getting growth every year in funding. I think there was an understanding they'd have growth of about 3% per year and then whatever was left in the bucket of 22% for independent schools would be applied to, to bring everyone closer to 22%. That's, as I understand it, the agreement that the, situ the, the department was in with ASA uh, up until this year, for many years. Um, Catholic education is much easier. They get 22% and then they have apply the adjustments themselves. within their schooling system. So um, when we determined that we needed to make a decision on whether we were going to join the Commonwealth and move to DMI, if you like, the direct measure of income for calculating parents' capacity to contribute, because, because that would have significant benefits for some schools, detriments to other schools in their funding, uh, it seemed that this was a time where we absolutely had to take steps to uh, ensure that we can reach that 22% for all of the non-government schools. Now... Um, that 22% is a complex measure too because, of course, we uh, uh, parents' capacity to contribute their, their income tax changes from year to year too. And it's also complex because uh, uh, schools have a budget for their coming year. If there's a dramatic change, that's problematic. So we have put in place a three-year transition. Uh, we're moving to a DMI outcome. We're moving to, uh, within that three years, for almost all the schools have that at 22 per cent. There's a couple of our schools that have a particular purpose supporting students with disability uh, where we've got some extra supports because they were amongst the schools that were doing better than 22 per cent before and uh, they don't have the benefits uh, of the broad system that either the public school system or even Catholic education have that provides those economies of scale to support, to support services for those schools. So we're being more generous in the transition uh, for those schools. Uh, and uh, indeed it's fair to say that there are um, uh, uh, that three year transition provides a little bit of uh, long term opportunity for schools to plan for that but in three years time uh, we will have the uh, 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 fairest in my view uh, model of how to distribute that and certainly the intention uh, I think of those that designed the process Thank you Minister uh, Will the government be looking at drawing on that DMI data to inform its assessment uh, of where funding under the no interest loans and additional capital grants uh, schemes 
might direct its money in the future. I, I don't think so. Thank you. Uh, budget paper five, budget paper five, Minister, page thirty-eight, review of regional school bus services. Um, can the minister give the committee an a, uh, explanation of, of how the money that the government has set aside, I think it's $2 million, will be spent and whether or not he believes it will meet all the, let's say, uh, unmet need out there? Look, I thank the member for the question. Um, this is a process that has uh, uh, taken some time. It certainly took longer than uh, uh, I ideally would have liked. Um, I'm certain that there's a number of families at Catholic schools and independent schools in regional South Australia who would have liked an earlier outcome. And uh, to them, I can only say that I, I'm really pleased to be part of a government that has now acted to provide some further support uh, for families uh, in that situation. Uh, it's fair to say that the um, uh, review of the government bus services provided um, a, a range of pieces of information that were useful in determining uh, a positive outcome. The um, uh, cost, I think, of um, some of the uh, proposals uh, would have, uh, certainly in my view and it's the, the government's view, um, not provided the benefit uh, that a particular uh, cost might have, uh, might have, uh, you might have hoped for. Um, and so it was determined uh, uh, by the government that the best way to provide support for those families uh, was through an alternative approach, which is these grants. So a uh, million dollars per year to Catholic education, uh, where they are able to, for those uh, regions that have the significant challenge, uh, apply it uh, in a way that will help. It may or may not fix all of the problems, but I have had such incredibly strong feedback from uh, uh, Catholic education uh, that it will provide a massive improvement uh, to, uh, to, to a range of those systems. And there's an alternative arrangement being put in place, again, because uh, independent schools provide many of the supports for services in the regions. They don't, again, have the system approach that the Catholic education does, but um, by uh, a grants process um, that, we work, that they're working on, uh, they're able to provide some support to their schools to be able to deliver an improved service for their families. So, so this money that is going to assist with transport to non-government schools and is in addition to the 22% of SRS that they receive, uh, is there any uh, requirement to report on its use for transporting students around? What is the acquittal of this money? Obviously, obviously there's um, um, uh, going to be some detail in that question, so I'll take it on notice and I'll bring back uh, the uh, strong detail of ensuring that um, the committee can have uh, access to that information. There's about 60 non-government schools located in the region. Um, I don't have the breakup of uh, which ones are Catholic schools and which ones are independent schools. Uh, our relationship in terms of the funding starts with uh, Catholic Education SA and the Association of Independent Schools SA. Member for Port Adelaide. Uh, thank you. Uh, Minister, are there any uh, shortfalls in government school transport arrangements for students in regional areas and has there been any additional money put to remedy those? Um, I'm not sure that the uh, relevant advisers for um, public school transport are on the floor of the chamber. Um, Chief Executive is not good enough. Chris Bernardi. Uh, with the Chair's indulgence, I might ask uh, uh, the Chief Operating Officer to make a return visit to the Chamber. We've just got to make sure that we socially distance on the way through. Policy settings for uh, government school students that were in place uh, when the member was the minister remain the policy settings and remain fully funded to those settings. And with that answer, the time allocated uh, and agreed for the portfolio of administered items has now expired. Therefore